Hello everyone! This video is entitled Ionic Bonding. In this lecture, I will explain what ionic bonds are and how they are formed. I'll also be discussing how the concept of electronegativity is linked to the formation of ionic compounds and the properties they exhibit. If you have not yet watched my video on electronegativity, it is recommended that you do so first to fully understand this material. You can find a link to that video in the description below. Okay, let's get started. Ionic bonding occurs due to the electrostatic attraction between pairs of ions. Some of you may be wondering what electrostatic attraction is. So just to review, an electrostatic attraction occurs when two oppositely charged objects, say a proton and an electron, exert a charged force onto one another over the distance of space between them. Since they're oppositely charged, their forces attract. So basically, electrostatic attraction is an attractive force exerted by two objects of opposite charges onto one another over the certain distance between them. So in the case of ionic bonding, after one atom transfers its electrons to the other, both atoms become oppositely charged ions that electrostatically attract to one another. Now, ionic bonds occur when a metal bonds with a nonmetal. However, it is important to remember that there are exceptions to this statement. It is possible, based on electronegativities, for a metal to form a polar covalent bond with a nonmetal such as uh, in the case of aluminum and chlorine. If the difference is greater than 1.7 between the electronegativities of two atoms, then you have an ionic bond. The formation of ionic compounds really brings to light how awe-inspiring the natural world can be. Now I know that sounds like a very grandiose type of statement, but follow me here. Take the formation of sodium chloride, for example. Sodium chloride is a salt that the human body cannot live without. This salt is needed to transmit nerve impulses throughout the body, contract and relax muscle fibers, uh, including the ones in your heart, and is needed to maintain a proper fluid balance. But how sodium chloride is used in the body is not what makes ionic bonding special, no. What makes this type of bonding incredible is how it radically transforms the metal and the nonmetal that are used to make sodium chloride. Sodium metal is violently reactive, especially with water. So considering that the human body is comprised primarily of water, if you were to consume a piece of raw sodium metal, it would most definitely kill you. It would do so by burning all the way into your digestive system. Chlorine gas, on the other hand, far worse. Chlorine gas, the main component of mustard gas used in World War I, is severely toxic and when inhaled causes acute lung damage and death. But if you look at the bottom of the slide here, to create sodium chloride, you need a very reactive sodium atom to transfer one single electron to an extremely toxic chlorine atom to make a salt that your body cannot live without. So to review, sodium, a soft silver gray, very reactive alkali metal, is added to chlorine, a toxic green yellow gas, to make sodium chloride a safe to consume white crystalline solid. It is because of simple observations like this one that I chose to pursue a career in science. When individual ionic compounds cluster together, such as those of sodium chloride, they form a complex structure called a crystal lattice. These are the ionic crystals that we so commonly see in our shakers or in bags sold at retailers. A crystal lattice is a 3D array of electrostatically attached ions. Remember, an ionic compound is a substance that has both positive and negative ions held together by these electrostatic attractions. Due to the exposed charges on these compounds, 
Many of them can connect to one another at room temperature to form these large crystal structures. Let's discuss some of the properties of ionic compounds. So as we know, ionic compounds form fixed crystal lattices. But what many people don't know is that these hard substances are also brittle. Despite their strength, large crystals of salts can be easily broken, cracked, or snapped into smaller pieces. And this is due to the gaps that exist within the lattice structure that widen under applied stress. It's also important to note that these bonds are much stronger than covalent bonds, as the formation of ions are more stable than their neutral atoms. And of course, these bonds will be stronger than atoms in their neutral state that share electrons to form covalent bonds. Because of their strength and the energy it takes to break these bonds, ionic compounds usually have extremely high melting points and boiling points. Sodium chloride, for example, uh, will only begin to melt when it reaches a temperature of 801 degrees Celsius. And once it's in its liquid state, it won't begin to boil uh, into a gas until it reaches a temperature of about 1,465 degrees Celsius. As we continue with the properties of ionic compounds, it's important to make absolutely clear that all ionic compounds are referred to as salt. When most people hear the word salt, they immediately think of table salt, sodium chloride. But salt can be any type of ionic compound. There are many different types of salts, bath salts, road salts, commercial salts, etc. Now, when most salts are placed in water, they completely dissolve and are called aqueous, which actually means dissolved in water. But how does a compound that is held together so strongly break apart in water at room temperature? Well, the driving force that separates ions in an ionic bond from one another is water. As we discussed in the last package, water has slight dipole charges. These partial charges are attracted to the ion charges in a salt, such as sodium chloride. The partial positive charges on water are attracted to chlorine, the negative ion. And the slight negative charges on water are attracted to sodium, the positive ion. The interactions between the ion and the dipole are called ion-dipole attractions, where the charges on a dipole on, of a polar molecule are attracted to the charges of an ion. Once the water molecules have completely surrounded the ions, the magnitude of the partial charges add together to overpower the attractive force between the two ions. This, of course, keeps the ions apart. Not all ionic compounds can be separated by water because the attraction within the ionic compound is too strong. For example, silver chloride cannot dissolve in water because water cannot separate those two ions. These aqueous ions are known as electrolytes because they conduct electricity. An electrolyte is a substance that conducts an electrical current in aqueous solution. When electrons are introduced to the solution, they are pulled and pushed through the water because of the dispersed ions. The positive ions attract the electrons while the negative ions repel them, causing the electrical current to course through the solution. Polyatomic ions and their compounds. Polyatomic ions are covalently bonded atoms that have a charge. But how does a charge develop on these compounds? Well, the answer to this question is through the use of coordinate covalent bonding. Now, I know some of you guys might be thinking, why is covalent bonding being mentioned in a package about ionic bonding? Well, this type of bond is very special because it has ionic and covalent character. It seems to have ionic and covalent bonding happening simultaneously. Coordinate covalent bonding is a situation where the pair of electrons being shared between two atoms was donated by one atom in the bond. Consider the example of the ammonium ion below. Since the nitrogen atom is the source of both the electrons 
in its bond with the hydrogen ion, it is acting ionically by giving away one electron to hydrogen, which then comes back and covalently shares it with nitrogen. So again, you got to think of this. There are two electrons on nitrogen and hydrogen has no electrons. Both electrons involved in the bond with the hydrogen is coming from the nitrogen. So nitrogen is actually giving one electron to hydrogen, which then comes back and shares it with the nitrogen. So ionic and covalent. And of course, because the hydrogen entered into the compound with a positive charge, the charge is spread over the entire compound, giving the polyatomic its positive charge. And with this, I conclude this slide and this package. Uh, I hope you understood everything I discussed and I hope you enjoyed listening. Thank you.